Secrets to a Happy Financial Marriage by Age. Man, doesn't everybody want to know the secrets to a good marriage? Tune in to today's show. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really, really excited about this. Because, um, you know, we've done marriage shows before in the past, but it's generally been around somebody actually getting married. It's been around, you know, newlyweds, or me or Gabe or whoever, actually, you know, taking that leap. But we thought we'd take it even a step further in today's episode. Well, we got feedback. We did a show back on May 10th of this year, which was titled How to Bulletproof Your Marriage Financially. But here's what I noticed with the feedback we got from our listeners. We focused on newlyweds and then everybody else. That's right. right. And we all know that's not how the progress of marriage Mm -hmm. goes. There are definitely phases of your marriage. You're going to go through that newlywed, you know, where you got the, you got, you know, you got some passion, you got the flame of marriage rocking and rolling. And then you go transition to to all these different periods, a seven year itch and, and so forth. And we'll get into that today. We wanted to kind of figure out if there was a way that we could share all the different secrets by stage. And then also, I always tell everybody, marriage and money. Those three words, marriage and money, they kind of, they get something stirring up here. Yeah, for they sure. create images in your head. And you, you know, when we were doing show prep, you, you came up with the three. I, I'll go ahead. I don't want to steal your thunder. What's the three images that you think typically come in people's heads? So I think a lot of folks, when they think about marriage, they have this just dream vision. They picture oh, the brand yeah. new house, the white picket fence, approximately. You can practically hear the birds chirping I mean, in that yeah, picture. I mean, yeah, that's it. So I think, I think some people... It's a cicada people, humming, because this is a cicada year. So it's, I mean, there's all kind of beautiful, cool things going on beyond not, that Not the fence. hummingbird, guys, the cicada. Uh, so, that, so that's the option one. But then there are other folks who maybe aren't so rosy, aren't so glamorous, and they have more of a cynical view of marriage. If Jerry Reed was alive, I would think he leaves comments in our YouTube channel, because there are definitely some people... People, if you ask them what their thoughts are on marriage, it's not positive. It's not a pretty and that's thing. What, if you've ever listened, by the way, if you have not listened, to the, this is a song. She got the gold mine, I got the shaft. If we could, I wish we could play this out loud. You'll be happy to know, Brian, you were actually out one day last week, and I was trying to pitch this idea to Reby and intern Daniel. Had never heard the song. Don't you worry, though. I gave them... <laughs> An education on the song. Oh, and she got the gold mine. So, so that's another that's another visual people get when you're talking about marriage that's and right. money. What's the next one? And so then the next one is okay. So there's the folks that think it's all going to be great. There's the folks that think it's going to be horrible. Well, then the third is <laughs> the folks who say, okay, what's yours is yours, what's mine is ours. This is just an agreement that we are going to enter we're, into. We're going to draw it right down the middle. And we're just going to hang out. We'll get all the benefits of being married, but we're going to keep our stuff separate. That's separated. exactly right. So that's those are the different phases. So if we were going to do a show, which we are, we're going to talk about what the traps to avoid, signs of success, and then the tools that you need to do as you're working through these different stages of your marriage. And I think the reason we talked about breaking it down this way, Brian, is that newlyweds, someone who's just now getting married, they probably ought to think about finances and think about the way they're handling finances different than someone who's been married for over two decades, yeah, right? It's true. So let's let's kind of jump into this. Perfect. Newlyweds, ooh la la. I mean, this is they call this the honeymoon period. That's exactly right. And this right. is where you know you're, you're. It's driven primarily in the beginning. It's driven by the passion That's right. of the marriage. But here's what here's what's funny to me is that you find out that marriage is all about passion, and you find out. Man, there's a lot of people, they blow it up in the Mm -hmm. first two years. So maybe that passion wasn't driving things as much as they like. And then, Bo, I like to pick on the fact that we did shows. We did quite a few shows in the past where you were, I don't want to say the butt of the joke, but you were definitely part of the content structure. the absolute butt of the joke. Because we did a show April 27th of 2012. Why is that date so important? Yeah, that was just a few weeks before I got married back in 2012. And I, you know, I'm a financial Love, guy. Love marriage and finance. I had designations. I had degrees. I just knew the way that money was going to work in my marriage. And so I wanted to share all the things I knew with our wonderful audience out there. So then fast forward a year later, June 14th of 2013. Well, listen to this title. So the first one was Love, Marriage, and Finances. The second, you know, after you've had your first one-year anniversary, we did a show, Marriage. 
An education. <laughs> Do you hear how that title changed? Obviously, you thought you had things figured out, and then you kind of got an education oh, in that first year I of got marriage. If, if you're someone who's new to the show, or maybe you weren't listening to it six or seven years ago, uh, we're actually going to put a link to both of those shows in the description. Go check that out, and you can actually listen to both of those shows. So I, I made I made the rabbit ears. For all those listening out there in podcast terms, I held up the rabbit ears because we do talk about the passion, the heat that's going on in the honeymoon, and that's great initially. But and I, look, I, but we got to bring down, because Bo, you had a great visualization. We got to bring that temperature down to a simmer so it's still we keep the marriage hot but you don't want the contents bowling over to where there's nothing left at the end of the day so we kind of want to jump into this uh, because this passion that doesn't actually turn into a simmer where you don't get beyond just the physical stuff you have going on and you can't figure out that i actually love and care and there's other parts of this marriage that i love daniel's divorce statistics or let me say about Daniel's divorce statistics. We do have that, you know, we got Halloween coming up. So you can see Daniel is going to dress up as the Grim Reaper, obviously. For sure. You know, we have these wonderful things. We're talking about marriage. And Daniel's thought, well, I think if we're going to talk about marriage, I ought to just put in their divorce stats all (laughs) through this show. So we're going to let him own that portion of it and talk about at each stage how the severance of marriage actually plays out. So here's the first two years of marriage. We knew this. I mean, Bo, you and I have talked. My first two years of marriage were some of the hardest. That's for, and you shared the same thing. One, the second year of marriage was by far, even to today, the single hardest year of marriage for us. And, and that makes sense because in the first two years of marriage, I mean, you're trying to figure a lot of stuff out. So, that, But the stats kind of prove this point that it is a tough transition period. Year two of your marriage, 10% of marriages, this is the highest year of divorces, 10% of marriages just fall off. In year two. And so what that tells me is that clearly there's not enough, if it's just passion, just heat, just excitement, there has to be something more to get it to, to move past that stage. So let's kind of, let's, let's talk about traps to avoid. Let's If we can help people avoid some of the mistakes that other people that are in the newlywed phase sure. avoid, let's get in this. And this is an easy one. This is understandable how this causes trouble. The first one is spending like you are still single. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because all you're not now, it's not just about you and what you do and the things you have going on. You have to factor in the other human being that is going on this journey with you. Um, we have now, look, I'm nowhere near the newlywed phase. You know, you're going to hear, find out which phase I am because I just huh? had my wedding anniversary like a week and a half ago. But we were out one, you know, this was after church. We were out with another couple, kids around and everything. And then the wife, Cause she knows, everybody knows I'm in the financial field. Uh-huh. They know I'm the money guy. And they're like, Brian, so let me ask you a question. Would you go out and buy a classic car without Oh, that's a um, landmine. Consulting she is just with your, cons- without consulting your spouse. And I knew, by the way, cause I know what's sitting in their driveway, <laughs> but this couple that has been married, and where the husband has been married long enough, he should know better. He had bought a classic car. Right and didn't consult his spouse and it was obviously causing some some animosity and and here's the thing it's not a permission thing right it's not a oh hey can i go do this it's a hey this is kind of our money let's talk about this is this something that we both are okay with i was smart enough i deflected sure i said you know guys (laughs) wise wise man you know I, i don't know that's not something we really talk about but you know but the true answer now that they're not sitting across the table from me looking is that you guys need to set up. You need to have conversations and boundaries mm-hmm. on what the thresholds are on what you can spend without re- consulting the other one. Now, sure. Bo, this is I'll pick on you again. Back when we did that show in 2012, you thought that number... Yeah, I was smart enough. I knew there had to be a number. So what was your number back in 2012? I thought when my wife and I got married, if either one of us wanted to spend more than $40, we should just (laughs) check in with the other. When Bo told me that stat, I said, by the way, you realize your wife's shampoo probably costs more, and there's no way she's calling you every time she buys a new jug of shampoo. I did not realize that shampoo cost that much because my swab was like a dollar. Yeah, your shampoo, you pay (laughs) $1.99. And you Use get that for 52 a whole year. ounces with a pump top on time there. It doesn't work that way for 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 the for our wives at least. That's right. We, we won't stereotype anymore. I, I did put in here, I, I mean, I wanted to share my own knowledge. First, I mean, we had like a two hundred dollar rule in my marriage. Probably in the last few years, that number's been pushed up to five to six hundred dollars. Sure. You know, so I realized 
this has to be an individual decision on what those spending and it's not a limit it's more of just hey if we cross this threshold i just need to keep my partner my love of my life just in the communication loop. And, and, and don't mishear this, because here's what I don't, I don't want the spouse out there to take this podcast and to go say, listen, listen, see, they told you you can't spend this much without asking mm-hmm. me for it. It's not about permission. It's just about respect and making sure you're on the same page. Um, and that's the second point. Uh, an indicators of success, you know, on, on just a trap traps to avoid. to avoid is just letting single debt steal your married happiness. Uh, again, this is another one. Communication is key, key, key. If you made some bad decisions in your previous life, maybe you racked up some debt, maybe you have some Mm -hmm. credit card debt, that's okay, that happens to people. Don't go into the marriage without letting your significant other know about that. That matters because what can happen is that thing that was so cumbersome to you, when you bring another human being into that, now it becomes cumbersome for both of you guys. And so you need to have an understanding on how you guys as a household are going to attack that together. Yeah, because you two have become one that debt that was maybe a, a, your spouse's has now kind of it's become coming yours. to your life. Yeah. So y'all got to create a plan together. Come That's together right. to figure out how to turn that single debt into yep. a, a, something that y'all are attacking. Here's the next one was not realizing that in addition to your or my financial goals, you now have our That's financial right. goals. You're going to start to notice a theme here. Exactly. There really is when two become one, you're starting to realize a lot of things that you might have been doing independently – are now turned into something y'all are doing as a group. So it's don't lose your identity, but you are definitely not a lone wolf anymore. You've got another player in this game. Now it does, again, you said it's not about just foregoing all of your goals, but it's about understanding there's more than just your goals. And then this is the last one that we we had during this section was only thinking about right now. And it's, it's, you know, when you're in this happy, passionate phase, you're probably thinking about, man, you know, we can afford now that we've brought taken two incomes and we you know and we brought them into two, one yeah. man we can there's a, there's a lot of things we can start doing here we can you know buy new cars we can you know get a dream house you can start doing all kind of things but you have to be careful measure twice cut once on making sure that lifestyle is not pushing up to where it's causing you a lot of long-term issues. Just because you can does not mean that you should. We hear this all the time, and we even we've even counseled young couples on this. Oh well, I can afford anything one month at a time. It's yeah. just two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks a month. We can afford that. That may not be the case. Make sure you're prioritizing what those future goals should be. Yeah, you do need it. I know it's it's hard, especially when you're first starting out to think long term, but a little goes a long way. And that's what I tell people is just make sure that y'all are creating a plan together so that you are setting some money aside exactly for right. yourself. So let's talk about indicators of success. We just went through the negative side, which were traps to avoid. Mm-hmm. Let's go now pivot and go to the positive side. These are some of the indicators of success is that first, have you combined your checking account? Yeah, again, you this know, is a controversial. This is super controversial because a lot of folks are going to write and say, oh, no, no, we're separate. I do mine, he does his, she does hers, whatever. What a combined account shows is that you guys have the ability and the propensity to make decisions together. Don't mishear us that we are suggesting you should combine everything. Our opinion is that you should, but that's not prescriptive, but you should be able to work together commonly on common accounts, common goals. Now, I do give a disclaimer, because I want to give, because I know that not everybody's created, you don't all have the same situations. There are some unique circumstances that can remain separated. That's inherited property. Um, Some of you might have some premarital property that needs to stay separated. Older marriage with complications, like you have children children from other marriages and things like that. However, for most marriages, exactly what Bo said, since you literally have two become one, just to save yourself a lot of animosity, resentment, and just to keep communication going, I do like the thought of pushing your different separate columns of assets into one is going to do a lot of good and exactly create right. it really there's a reason we call this an indicator of success. Um, the, the second thing I had was, if this is something I can tell to people who are running separate. If you're not going to have combined accounts, by God, you better have a create a household budget that's combined. You have to have be working off the same sheet music. Uh, you know, I think if if you're if you're going to be good with money, you have to practice making good decisions with money. Now, this is a telling question. I'm asking on purpose. It's out of question. Do you budget right now? 
No. No, right? No, you don't, I don't have to. I have a great cash management exactly plan. Right. But budgeting is, I think, is one of those, and this is why we put it in the newlywed mm -hmm. section is because this is something you have to practice. How do you get good at shooting free throws? You shoot free throws over exactly and over right. again so you get really good muscle memory. It's the same thing with the way you use your finances yep. and cash flow. So in the beginning, I have had budgets. I don't like the budget. But I have definitely in my lifetime done budgeting. But as you get older, and you'll see this, guys, as you mature with your money, you will create cash management plans, which effectively work like a budget where it's just your money has every dollar in your army of dollar bills, has a purpose, and automatically through automation will go into savings yep. towards paying down your debt early. Everything just kind of already has a place and it fulfills that. But in the beginning, you kind of have to know where every dollar is going so you can have a very good, effective plan. I just think about it, you know, when my wife and I sat down, if she didn't want me to know that she spent more than $40 on shampoo, yeah. and she would have said, oh, well, I, we're not gonna do a budget, because she did, that just wouldn't be setting us up for success. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it lays it all out so you can have a good conversation around that. So that leads to, because you're talking about you and your wife talking about the shampoo. Mm -hmm. Here's the next point indicator of success is, have you had that first, what, we have and where it's at meeting. This is, but I picked on you because I think you said you were going to do this on the plane trip to your honeymoon. You I, thought y'all were going to be having this meeting. I mean, we all know what happens on the honeymoon. I thought this was going to be the thing that got her going, right? I thought this was going to be the thing that really got her excited. Let's talk about what we're going to spend on our marriage. Man, uh, nothing gets the gets the ladies and the spouses working. The non-financial <laughs> partner is definitely going to love this meeting. Uh, yeah, and so obviously that didn't quite go the way I thought. So what I did is I said, hey, after the honeymoon, let's uh, we'll talk about this some other time. But it is important. You guys need to lay out as a couple, hey, here's all the things we have. Here are the good things. I saved this much money. I have these assets. I have this whatever. But also, hey, I do have credit card debt, or I do have student loans, or I do have this. And even more so, if one of the spouses is the one who primarily handles the finances, because yeah. we see that all the time. It's not gender specific, by the way. It's not always the worker. No, it's, it's not, not the one that even home. makes all the money. That's you're exactly right. right. You're exactly right. But if one person takes takes the reins on, on, on driving that ship, it is important that the other spouse knows where and how to get to the stuff that you guys have because you just want to make sure if something were to happen to you, they're protected, they're taken care By of. By the way, I made the statement, just an off-remark statement, that you need to both be on the same sheet music. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're playing the bass and she's playing lead guitar, they need to be reading off the same yep. sheet music. The sheet music that is probably very effective, that I have found very effective for my marriage, is that net worth statement. Absolutely. So it's one of those things, I will tell you, we have some developments coming. Too early to really unleash it, but um, it, it is, we have some exciting news out there in the long term, so just stay Love tuned it. for that. But let's transition to this last one, is that at the end of year two, you're really hoping you've graduated from it's his or her money to it's our money. That's exactly that is right. a, if you can get your mind around that, it will make your wife a lot better um, when you really do two becoming one. You notice that's the theme of this whole yep. new, newlywed concept. Let's quickly talk about the tools of success that you're going to be. These are the things that that, that honeymoon section mm -hmm. that will be your friends and help you. We've already mentioned this first one is a budget. So there's actually resources out there yeah, for this. Yeah, there's a ton of fantastic apps. You can use, uh, you need a budget, every dollar, mint. You can do a good old fashioned spreadsheet. That's what, you know, when my wife and I first got married on the honeymoon, it was the Excel spreadsheet that yep. I tried to break out on her. Uh, but there are so many tools that make life so much easier. Maybe you're not someone who's financially minded. That's okay. There are tools that will make that a, an easier thing for you to do. Also, another tool, because remember, compounding interest is going to be your friend with the younger you are. So use those index target retirement funds. Yep. It's not where you're putting necessarily. It's how much you're putting so that that compounding. So why not make it as easy as it possibly can be on yourself by looking at target retirement funds? We like the index varieties. You, you know, some of the biggest players are Vanguard, mm -hmm. Fidelity, those type of things. I've already mentioned this one too, net worth statements. Yep. This is going to be your roadmap, the sheet music that you guys are going to be working off of together. It will be a great annual tradition for you to go and review these things. So make use of that tool. And then lastly, Bo, we had goal planning sheet list. I think this is this so- This is a fun thing. Yeah, this is so important. This is the fun one. So you talk about the finances. Well, then you talk about, okay, what do we ultimately want to do in this life together? We just yep. started it. What are our goals? What trips do we want to go on? What's our dream house look like? What do we want to do about kids, family, retirement? 
make a list in that first two years or these are the things that we prioritize. And it's important because this list is gonna come back later on in the show. So that's the first five years of marriage. That's the part, like I said, that was powered by passion. We transition after that first five years of marriage into this, and this is so, I hate this because honeymoon sounds sexy, uh -huh. it sounds fun. And then you transition into, and I can almost hear the wah, wah, wah. <laughs> It's a seven year itch. Yeah, this is for folks who've been married. It doesn't even sound good. No, it doesn't sound good. We, we're classifying the seven year itch period as folks who've been married anywhere from six to 10 years, Yeah, right? So I, this actually is me. This is where I fall in. This is where my wife and our, I, I are right now in terms of how long we've been married. I've already driven through this this part yeah, of the, you've, the road trip. You've, you've <laughs> this, was, this is way in the I looked out the window to the left. I looked out the window to the right. Even stopped at a few places to make sure that I learn some wisdom, but, and that's what we're gonna share some of that. But it is, and why, where does this term, this seven year itch? This is a sad statistic. Uh, but and this, this is even before we get to Daniel's divorce stats. But it is true that the seven year itch refers to the average length of a marriage that ends in divorce. In 2017, the average length of a marriage that will end in divorce is approximately eight years. Now realize, there's, there's a whole legal process that has to go That's in. Right. So it probably is somewhere in that six year, seven year mark mm -hmm. that people start going, what in the world's going on here? And that's what we want to kind of help you avoid some of those problems because there's also some distractors that are out uh, there in your marriage this this far into it. Is it probably, you know, between six and 10 years, you've, you've got kids, yep. you got you got these 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 trophies Tricycle of the voters. love of the marriage that you know that you have here are these yeah. children that are the result of this marriage. The, and we all think you know the, the fairy tale of children is man this is going to be so easy. It's going to bring us so much closer. Oh, man, it's, I can just see the the and that does eventually. There are some tremendous benefits. But anybody who's got and you, you you're closer <laughs> to this phase than <laughs> right I am. There. Those first two years we call them in the weeds for yeah, a reason, man. man. Kids are tough. That's exactly right. I mean, I'm looking Morpheus knows too. I mean, we have multiple people here that know you know these little kids that will one day become self-sufficient, earn a living. They really humans are for as powerful as human beings are really helpless when they're little <laughs> really it's not like they're they're not baby deer where they come out and they start jotting and running around the field <laughs> immediately baby humans they, they they just make a lot of chaos and so and we don't want to minimize i mean look newlywed phase is hard there's no doubt about it we just said second year is the highest divorced year but life just as we age it tends to just get a little more complicated a little bit hard a little more complicated and so this six to ten year window it's kind of a tough one from a marriage standpoint. So, Bo, go ahead, because I feel like, and I like how Daniel put a different Grim Reaper picture for everyone. He really had a lot of fun with this. So, Daniel's divorce stats, what did he put on the, on the seven-year Yeah, he said around the seven-year point in a marriage, kids no longer protect the marriage from divorce. So, what ends up happening is when you first get married and maybe you're going through so say, okay well we'll have a kid and that'll change things and you're like okay well, we'll stay together for the kid well the kids <laughs> begin to start getting a i've never more... understood that how in the world does a, having children make things better it is a, it's, it, the, it's like it's whoo, the people let's drop a grenade in this thing and see if that <laughs> grenade makes a pretty garden and so what happens the kids get a little bit older they get a little more self-sufficient still not self-sufficient a little more self-sufficient so now the marriage is no longer held together by the need to make this baby stay alive it's right. not bottles and diapers and and babas and poo poos and stuff. Uh, and so the average length of marriage that ends in divorce, like you said, is right there, right at eight years long. So let's, let's try to figure out what are these traps that you need to avoid so you don't fall into Daniel's divorce statistics. You know, the first thing, and this is an important one, guys, I will tell you if you want to help your marriage is understand what brought you and your spouse together. And then as y'all, as that love has grown the family to have children, mm -hmm. You need to make sure that letting the kids become the center of not only your financial life, but your personal life can cause some bad things. Yeah, if, if you had kids as, as a means to keep the marriage together and then you were dependent upon the kids to keep the marriage, that's just not set up on solid foundation. Because ultimately, even if all goes great, those kids are going to fly the nest one day. And so you need to make sure that you and your spouse are on solid financial footing don't let the kids be the glue that holds it together. I mean, I think, look, I don't think, maybe y'all think this is mean. Oh, what's good? No. What, <laughs> Ravi, what's coming? Show, show I have no problem telling either one of my kids 
that their mother comes before oh, either one. I mean, and 100%. I think that's it. You tell that because 100%. what you're hoping is your kids, if they understand that, it keeps them, first of all, it keeps them humble, but you hope it's modeling a behavior that they'll say, man, I hope my spouse puts me before anything yeah, else. Absolutely. And that's what always, plus it also, because, you know, as you start having kids, you go, you do go from that, you know, where, man, isn't it great we have a kid to start, you, you play man to man. And then if you have more than two, you go to zone. Mm -hmm. It's nice if you have a partner that you can go, that kid's crazy. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we made that baby, but that kid, that kid crazy. I mean, it's nice if you have a teammate that you're kind yeah. of, you're in yep. this together versus sometimes you see situations where it, it can be one or maybe even two of you together. You put that child at the center of your universe mm -hmm. and that can cause long-term ramifications, especially financially I was going to say, yeah, it, it is so bad relationally. It's also really bad financially. We've done a great show on the financial order of operations. If you want to go check that out, we're going to put a link in the description of this, of this video. Uh, but you can see it's not towards the top of the list. It's actually after you get your financial footing. Yeah. Uh, it's in the in fourth place. quarter. That's I mean, right. that's what I always tell people. So don't let your kids take too much of your yep. oxygen. Um, the next thing, assuming you will live forever. I mean, this is powerful, Bo. Yeah, yeah. So, let's, so, you, so let's say you do have the kids and you're in that stage. Now it's important that you protect this family that you've built. You do yeah. want to make sure that you have the things in place that you need, like life insurance, like disability insurance, like umbrella insurance. Just because you are young does not mean that you're invincible. Folks who've been married for six to 10 years, most often tend to be younger still. I would throw myself in that category, but you're not invincible. So make sure you're protecting those things that really matter to you. Now look, six to 10 years, you're still probably a pretty young person yeah. through this phase, but you still have to, you have to protect yourself from that Tuesday afternoon where you get hit by the bus. That's right. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. That's that's exactly you right. said it already, but the life insurance, the wills, all that type of stuff, Disability, umbrella insurance, make sure all those things get protected. Yep. Um, next one, understanding the unique and distinct financial roles. Now, Brian, you'll have to tell me if you agree with this. I feel like what I've seen amongst my friends in peer group for um, marriages that have not gone well or ended well is folks missing this a lot. Missing what is my role, what is your role, and placing actually more value on one than the other. Yep. Oh, well, I'm the one who goes out and works and I make all the money for this household and your job is to do this, this, and this. Well, think about this. In those first two years of marriage, I know we're past that. We're no longer in the honeymoon period. But I know one of the things that I struggled with was when, I, fortunately, I grew up washing dishes. Okay. So I'm the dishwasher. Okay. Fortunately, my wife is OCD about laundry, okay. meaning that Brian... College, I, I've been doing my own laundry since I was in the eighth grade, but all laundry gets washed in the same wash. Oh, we there's, don't no, sort. there's no color sorting. No, you just don't buy red. <laughs> you know what the secret to life is? You went to just Georgia, don't that can't buy be red. true. Well, I, I would recycle, I would wear, my red would get washed once every quarter. <laughs> oh, there we go. So you wear undershirts with red. That's Got what it. you do, Perfect. Bo. You don't wash red with anything else. Everything else can get thrown in. But so, but me and my wife, when it came to scrubbing commodes, nobody wanted to do that. Nobody, nobody, nobody that wants to be the commode scrubber. <laughs> so you got to have open communications on the roles you're going to play. And, right. and, and just like that's an obstacle you have to overcome, you have to figure out. And these are the roles kind of we're talking about, Bo, is that, you know, eventually you are going to probably, one spouse is probably going to become the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you're both working, one's going to earn more money. So you have to talk about that, That's figure right. that out. And then as you start having children, who's going to kind of be, if, if, that, if it's important that one spouse is going to stay at home and play more of a domestic role versus the other one out there with the economic, right. how does that all, and this is why, now you're starting to say, the, this is where the wisdom kicks in. You go, oh, wait a minute, I'm starting to catch on why two needs to become one and we don't need to keep all of our assets yeah. separated because... If I'm the guy, and I'm, and look, like I said, it's not this is, I'm a traditionally, I am a man, my wife's the woman, but we see all type of situations mm -hmm. where you can't, it, it's not gender, it's not, you know, the way the marriage is structured. There is going, but there is going to be somebody that makes more right. money, and you have to take those things into account. And if you came into the marriage as the breadwinner, and you kind of are flexing on that because y'all have separate accounts. And, th and, and maybe this spouse was working, making a decent living, but then is now doing the domestic sure. stuff of raising kids. 
how do they need to come to you every time they need money because y'all keeping separate accounts? Right. I think that creates some really hostile, yeah. weird relationships. And it also creates some, I, I will tell you, in my marriage, I got some no-go land. I mean, this is area that, whew, if you want to... If you want to ensure that that flame of your marriage is just going to be, you know, it's almost got a pot <laughs> over the, the lid there, you know, to make sure that flame doesn't get hot. Oh, you know, I know I can't say, here's no go land in Brian Preston's okay. house. I make the money. Oh, if I yeah. said that, gone. I mean, my wife is, go- I mean, I might have stuff thrown at me. <laughs> and here's another one my wife finally corrected me on. Honey, I'm tired of babysitting. You can't babysit your own kids. That's what she you said know, to you? No, I said that. To me. You're the, my wife's smarter than I no, am, No, no, no. I said she told you that you can't babysit yeah, your she own said, kids. I said, honey, I, I, I can't babysit today. I got to go do it. Honey, she was like, you <laughs> can't babysit your, kids, your own kids. You know, so these are, so I know I can't talk about who's watching the kids so much, who makes the money. Though That is all no-go yep. land. You have to basically come to a mutual respect of who's going to do what in the household, and it has to function. It has and you to have work. to and you have to value what those different roles, different responsibilities are. Um, you know, and, and that, I think we've beaten on that enough. And I want to kind of transition one of the last ones, which was not commuting, communicating well. Well, speaking of not communicating, <laughs> not communicating well, and then keeping financial secrets. Yeah, that that's a big one. And again, I, I think we see this all the time. We actually have friends who taught us about. Oh, well, I've got this card over here. I've got this account over here that so and so doesn't know about, or that's my play account. And it's one thing if you know, we we have couples all the time that have different blow money pots. Yep. I have my blow money. He or she has her blow money. That's different than keeping financial secrets than mm-hmm. having the credit card that's offline. That's yeah. that's a offline thing. credit cards, secret accounts. That's and truthfully that's no go land too. Yep. And then the last one we had on, on this section was. Um, you know, all the distractions of life can really push and take your eye off the, 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 the ball. Yeah, you get stuck in that grass is greener mindset, thinking that, oh, well, you know, this didn't go exactly the way that I thought. I need to go shift over here and think about something else. And that's just not a... That's dangerous, you, too. You, you taught me, one of the things you taught me really early on in my marriage, Brian, is that you have, I have to control the voice, the inner voice in my head. It's one of those things. Uh, hey, look, I, like, I've been married 21 years. I can't believe I'm saying that. That doesn't even sound right. 21 years. I must have gotten married when I was 15. Yeah, I had like 10. Um, but it's one of those things that I learned along the way. Like I said, there's a lot of road wear on road trips here of things to do and things not to do. And one of the things that I had to learn, and I think my wife had to learn this too, is that we all have this inner voice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you think you, you, you're your own worst enemy in the fact that you, you're thinking about, man, I just don't, she doesn't appreciate me, mm-hmm. you know, or he doesn't appreciate me, right. or, you know, I'm taking for granted. Um, you know, there's all this stuff that just bubbles up under the surface. And then you start playing mind tricks with each other. And we'll get into this even in some deeper phases, but you'll start going, man, maybe, I, maybe I'm deserve, maybe I'm entitled to this, mm-hmm. or the grass is greener over here. Get that stuff. Whatever is going on in your brain with that inner voice, turn that negative into a positive. Right. Don't look at a glass half empty. Look at it as glass half full. What are the blessings in your life? What are the things? And one of the things I always tell people when they're struggling, I'm like, look, you got yourself in this situation where you attract, you were attracted to this type of personality and this person. There's a good chance, even if you hit reset, blew it all up. You're going to end up in the exact same situation with somebody who is just like Very that similar. because you're attracted to that type of, in That's some right. weird way, so true. there is something you probably were attracted to. But get the communication, get that inner voice right, and I think it will help you fix a lot of the mindset things and control that voice in your head. So how do you know if you're doing it right at 6 to 10? Let's talk about some of the indicators of success. The very first one, you hear the Money Guy Show, you hear us talk about this all the time. A financial indicator of success at this stage is you are hitting that 20 to 25% savings goal. You need to be saving 20 25%. If you're hitting that, it's a sign that your marriage might be on sound financial footing. You are doing it right. This is the part where you might be graduating from the budget to a cash management plan because you have automated your financial right. life to where things are going right where they're supposed to. And and it's just great. Plus, it takes out all those emotional roadblocks yep. that you'll do. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? Who cares? Because you're saving 20 25%, rain or shine, you're making right. good decisions. Next indicator of success, paying off that credit card every month. Yep, I think paying just even just paying off debt in general yep. is huge. What I think is so great is when you're newlywed, it's just the way life works. 
you, when you do your net worth statement, debt can, tends to tick up, tick up, tick up. What's beautiful is around this stage, you actually start doing some net worth statements and yeah. that debt, that total debt load starts to go down, which is fantastic and exciting. Um, just because I, I, I know we have to keep moving on this, but keep the debt below, below 35%. Auto debt needs to be 20% down, paid off, three years amortization, yep. no more than 8% of your total net worth. Housing, less than 25% of your adjusted gross income. That's exactly right, that's perfect. Um, risk are covered at this section. This is another indicator of success is you got the appropriate life insurance. You got, because you got kids, mm -hmm. you got those trophies of the love of your marriage, you might as well have wills that reflect this stage of life. That's exactly right. And then you've got an emergency fund that's gonna set you up no matter if you lose your job hot water heater blows up, you get in a car accident, you're on good stable ground. Now, what I think is great, there's a bunch of tools you can use in this phase. Brian, the very first one we came up with, <laughs> it doesn't even have anything By to do way, with You finances. came up with this one, I give you mad credit well, for this. It's because I'm in this stage. Yeah. Like this one is one I, I recognize I have to prioritize, is a date night. Yeah. If if you find yourself in your marriage and that simmer is not simmering, you gotta do something to get it going. So one of the things that I try to do is I try to put a date night on the calendar with my wife every month. I should probably do it every week, but with our kids, we're just busy. At least once a month, we go do something, just she and I. It just allows us to keep that flame burning. Remember, the whole analogy we did earlier on the pot, you want to keep the contents of the marriage hot, guys. You got to keep it, you got to keep that thing going, keep That's the right. passion there. So the date night's going to help with that. It doesn't have to be, I know Bo said on his honeymoon he was going to be talking budgets. It doesn't always have to be financial, but definitely... Make sure you're yep. taking your loved sure. one out. Um, annual net worth statement, Bo, that's a powerful tool. You gotta be doing it at this stage. High yield savings account, because remember we got cash reserves. That's one of the indicators of success. You might as well make sure you're not in a brick and mortar. Make sure you're getting those, you know, two over great, greater than 2% interest rate. I know that dates this show now when interest rates are eventually gonna be 4%, sure. but you, could, you should at least maximize with a high yield savings account. You got life insurance, yep. that's a tool. Estate documents. Hey, here's a quick note on that. Um, so uh, the newlyweds might not have listened to us, right? They, yeah. didn't, they didn't get it when we told them to. So now you went out to uh, legal, I don't remember the name of it, but let's assume there's one that you can do online that you can do it yourself. It's important to note that estate documents matter. They have to be executed the right way. So just do some Google research in your town and your state to make sure that you do that the right way. Like the right witnesses and other exactly. things. Exactly. And then other things. Here's here's one that, you know, sometimes you'll have a trust or other things created. Make sure you actually do what the attorney That's wants exactly you to right. do as well. That's good execution as well. And then the, one of the last things we had on here is goal prioritization breakdown. Do if, you know? Go ahead. Go if ahead. you remember that, that, that sheet of dreams that you made in the newlywed stage, now you actually, this stage, you have to start prioritizing them. What are 10 out of 10s and what are 1 out of 10s? And how yeah. are we going to organize how we want to start attacking these financial long-term life goals we have? Yeah, and I liked it because some of those goals could be retirement, college, kids, Pre-college, mm -hmm. you know, if you got private school and That's other right. things, trips, how important is it creating those Absolutely. memories? And then, of course, houses and cars. So that's that stretch. So we transition from the seven-year itch, right, which I'm is out. six to ten. See you later. We just covered This mine. is when you uh, count on my wisdom, right? Which now we have the phase of catching your stride. That's right. Ten to twenty years. Okay. Moment of confession here. I feel like, if, like the lights just no, went no, dead. No, 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 here, here, here's the truth. First two years of marriage, a little rocky. A little more. There's okay. a lot of transition. Remember scrubbing toilet bowls. I mean, it's hard figuring out who's scrubbing the toilet bowls. So two, first two years, because you're used to being on your own, and now you're married. You do some give and take. Fast forward. You know, things are good again. But then you hit that seven-year itch, and you're like, you feel like communication's breaking down. You know, maybe, maybe the the... Your, your, your soup pot is the, the temperature went down a little more than you wanted it to and you're trying to get the heat back up. So you make it through the, but then you get it right. And you know, that gets fixed. You go, maybe you need to go talk to somebody. You get that fixed and you make it through the seven year itch. Then you hit this catching your stride. God, I gotta tell you, I don't remember. I do remember, but it just went by so fast. I asked my, I just had my 21st wedding anniversary and I, I told my wife, I was like, it doesn't feel like we've been married that long. It yeah. just doesn't. Because, I mean, I feel like years 8 through 20 just flew by. I mean, it was a blink of the eye. And, I, and it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened. But it is one of those things where, because it, it makes sense. Because think about it, in your 20s, you, you just start in your career. It's kind of a struggle. You don't make much, a, a ton of, of money. Change. Yeah, you yeah. don't. Well, you don't make a lot of money either. You're, you're trying to figure out where you are in the world. You're trying to figure out your career. And then you throw kids on top of that. And that's like... 
you already got chaos and then you throw kids in there and then you got all these life goals you're trying to accomplish like buy houses uh -huh. get set up and, and transition it's it's finally this is probably by the time you're catching your stride you are probably getting somewhere to where you can come up for air mm -hmm. i mean it just it just feels like the basics are covered and you can come up for air sure you got a little more breathing room that's probably why plus the kids are now feeding themselves they're not pooping on themselves anymore they're actually you know go to bed at night they you know take baths so it, it the kids get easier yeah. and you can focus on your spouse more so yep. that's probably why let's talk about daniel's Daniel's divorce stats. Look at a different Grim Reaper, Reaper picture. But what's the stat here that Daniel came up with? Yeah, so he said after year 10, there's actually a significant drop in the risk of divorce. So once you can make it through the first decade, it drops off. Um, and then it says that by year 20, the chance of divorce is actually one in eight. So that's pretty incredible. Low so that percentage. means that's, that's 12%. I mean, if you do the math on that. So in your head. Okay, so remember, I'm in this phase. So I was like, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That means, like, you know, 88% chance that <laughs> it's gonna work out. My poor wife, because I'm never worried about me leaving. I'm worried about making sure I'm keeping her because I'm a weird cat. I mean, you, you got to put up with a lot of stuff when you mar were married to me. So it's kind of nice knowing that stats working out. So that, that's so let's let's talk about traps to avoid. Here's the first big one because realize you've been married for a while by now. When you're 10 to 20 years into this. The first trap that you should try to avoid is not creating a vision plan for the future. You're yeah. kind of just stuck. You're sleepwalking. Mm -hmm. I think you say all the time, people at this age range that this generally falls into, they just kind of get stuck in letting life sort of happen. And you said, just like you said, you blinked and yeah. the last 12, 10, 12 years flew by. If you didn't actually have a plan in place to make sure you were charting the correct course, you could wake up one day and say, oh, oh my goodness, where are we? Did, yeah. We haven't even thought about retirement and now we're halfway there. You know, we've done shows on what you should, you know, 401k balance by age, mm -hmm. net worth by age. I'm always amazed, you know, because the average 401k balance, you know, for a 40 to 49 year old is 102,000. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it's just, it's crazy. Um, 30 to 39 year olds, it's 42,000. I sure. mean, it's just a lot of people, those numbers seem a lot lower than they should be. I would rather, if you go go to sleep or just enjoy, you set your life up on autopilot. I'd rather you set your life up on autopilot in a good way through yep. that automated plan where you might not remember every year and everything that happened, but if you set up your cash management plan where you are saving that 20 to 25% automatically through an automatic savings plan, you're gonna wake up one, you're gonna wake up in the future and go, Wow! How, how did we build this all is, this? This up? is great. And this is that's going to lead to some really healthy conversations in a good way down the road. So you're not sleepwalking and waking up one day and going, "Whoa, I'm in trouble. Yeah. I'm really behind." Hopefully, you get to wake up and go, "Man, I'm blessed. This yep. thing is going really well." So, so make sure you're understanding. And this is also the phase since you are coming up fair. You can talk about force scarcity. Mm -hmm. This is why is you're getting those pay raises. You are squeezing more into savings, more into paying down debt quicker so that you never feel completely comfortable because you're always challenging yourself financially. That's exactly right. So the next thing, the other trap to avoid is lifestyle creep. And this works perfectly well. I was just talking about lifestyle creep and keeping up with the Joneses. I think I think one of the things that happens is that at this stage, you do get to come up for air. Things have calmed down. You kind of look around and say, oh, well, he has this and she has that and they have this. And you start thinking, oh, well, they have it. I should have it. Yeah. I should be able to go do the things that they're doing. And you do start trying to keep up with the folks around you. It's, um, I have a daughter in high school. And, you know, I, looking back on my life, I look back at high school years. You don't realize how materialistic high schoolers are. I mean, Until you have a high schooler. Right, well, I mean, it just brought back memories. Because I, I know in high school, there was this phase where the, the clothes you wore, the car you drove... That was very important. Mm -hmm. You know, you could you could potentially even date somebody outside of your punk coverage if you had, had right some of those car, things yeah, working yeah. for. I, I, you know, fast forward, went to college. I felt like even though I was one of the poorer kids at college, I, I felt like as long as my personality and, and the intelligence were there, I didn't feel like not having money hurt me that much. Yeah. And I said, there was a lot of I saw really rich kids in college, sure. but I felt like it was a little more level playing field. It was more on how well you your EQ yeah, skill yeah, set. Yeah. But then you get a little older, get married, you get in this phase where you build into, you know, buy into a neighborhood. Now it is more back on how big's your house, what type of car do you drive, what type of vacations, what private schools do your kids go to. Yep. All these things can really put a lot of pressure on you to expand and keep up. I even saw a stat the other day where there's a lot of kids right out of school, college, that are getting in financial trouble because they're trying to 
recreate the lifestyle their parents had created. Yeah. And, and they have nowhere near it. So That's guys, right. don't let lifestyle creep, creep of keeping up with the Joneses ruin your financial life because it's just that's not healthy i think you said what well, the biggest thing you can do there is you just have to know what you value and what brings you happiness and pursue those things not the things that you perceive make you look like you're happy i think that's a great a great way to wrap that up let's talk about indicators of success so the first thing on indicators of success is you know where you're going with your financial life this is you know in the easy question you can ask yourself is do you have a financial plan? Yeah, if you are someone who just woke up and you said, oh my gosh, here I am. Have you talked about, okay, well, here I am. Do I know where I want to be in the next 20 years? Because yeah. this isn't exactly the halfway point, but for a lot of folks, it kind of is. When you think about a 40-year working career, you're hitting the crest of that hill. Yeah, you're 10 thinking, to 20 years. I mean, you're not, you're not, look, I just made it through. I'm at 21 years. I'm not exactly, I'm not, a, I'm still young. But I'm not a spring chicken. That's anymore. right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I mean, I'm, I'm probably getting the eating age. If if you don't, if, <laughs> did you just say eating age? Uh, I said spring chicken. So you know, I mean, I'm getting hungry. We've been doing quite a few podcasts today, and I haven't eaten in a while. So I think just a big indicator of success is that you and your spouse in your marriage, you both know where you're headed. Hey, we do want to pursue financial independence. We do want to be able to send our kids to college. We do want this kind of lifestyle we're talking about. And these are the steps that we're taking moving there. Yeah, in your, in your life, you have career figured out. You probably have family and you're working with purpose. There's a reason you wake up in the morning. This yep. is the next one is you wake up in the morning. You're excited about where you're going. I, I know it sounds crazy, but there are just too many people in my view that are unhappy when they go to work. Yeah, it's sad. It's, it's really, really, really I don't sad. want you. If you're chewing fingernails on Sunday night, something's probably not quite right in your, in your life. And I, I challenge you to kind of work on that. And if that's the case, if you are someone who hates your job and just can't, there's a chance that's going to bleed home. There's a yeah. chance that's going to come home with you and it's going to affect your marriage. So you just need to think about where you are, make sure you're happy where you are. Glass half full perspective. You probably at this point in your career, you've got 10,000 10, hours. So you're an expert in your field. This is the, the stage where you could probably make some changes and right. be able to recover from a risk capacity standpoint. You have time yep. on, your, on your side. So if you're upset at work, you said it, you know, it is That's one right. of those things he carries with you. Um, you still want to make sure, is everything simmering? Is that heat? It's back to that passion. Are you keeping that pot where there's some flame on that pot to make sure the marriage, because I mean, 10 to 20 years, you want to make sure you're not taking each other for granted at this point. Well, and Brian, you've said this to me all the time. You know, you're at that stage where you have, you know, your kids are getting the age where like college is like on the horizon. Yeah. And stuff. They're going to leave the house and it's going to be you and your wife again. And you better make sure that thing is still simmering because when the kids aren't there, you kind of look around like, all right, well, what are we going to do now? Right. It matters. So have a plan. You know, one of my favorite things is my wife and I have a travel kind of bucket list. Okay. And we do it treat it as a date night. So have a special, you know, date night where you can talk about your travel wish list because mm -hmm. that's fun to talk about daydreaming Love it. and anticipation is good. If you need counseling, don't ever be scared to go talk to somebody and make sure that communication is working well between you and even try hobbies and cooking classes. Love it's it. all kind of fun. I mean, one of my favorite things I'm doing right now um, that my, I consider almost like a midweek date night, we do some of those food boxes. Oh, they like send we you do. the I get two meals a week and then two nights a week you know and it, it varies every week because the kids are doing a gazillion things but we cook together it's fun That's i mean awesome. i turn on some music and we cook it, it is a lot of fun and i think those are those are powerful things for for keeping the the marriage energized so let's talk about the tools first thing i mean it's kind of it's us we yeah. resemble this one right. fee only fiduciary that's a big word and it's a powerful word, financial planner. You want a fee-only financial planner that works in your best interest, which is a fiduciary. You know, it's really interesting when we look at the, you know, because we do analytics on the type of folks we work with and the types of clients we, we have. It's really interesting. A lot of the folks that we work with fall into this age range. Now, they may or may not have been married for this exact amount of time, but for the folks that are married for 10 to 20 years, that's kind of the folks who actually do come see us. It's a great point in your life to start thinking about what does the plan look like and how do I begin putting that plan in place. Um, I like, you. this is a, th a thread, You're, I mean, a, a trend here, annual net worth statement. Guys, oh, yeah. I started doing it when I was 31 years old. I'm mad I didn't do it when I was 21 years old. And what I think is great, since you started at 31, yours has gone 
uh, less from this like hypothetical thing you're thinking yeah. about. Now yours is, is almost like a treasure map and you can see how far you've come so far, right? It's almost like you can track the journey. You like that I'm willing to share it with you too. So you, yeah, can, you can play absolutely. Who, who's doing well to compared where to what. I was back then. Um, and this was, we also, this is another repeat, but I think it's very important. Adequate insurance, disability, umbrella, all your risk, life insurance, all your risk are covered. Nobody is going to be hurt if by some chance that, that Tuesday afternoon That's goes right. bad. So, exactly. so pay attention to those things. Let's transition. This is the last phrase that we talk. I'm actually part of it. You, I cannot you, believe You are this. in this phase Oh, wait, this was a heated discussion in show prep. It's because all the pictures that the team put up on this, I'm like, guys, I'm in this segment. <laughs> How can you say this? This is the uh-oh, now what group? This is the empty nesters, 21 to 40 years of uh -huh. marriage. I'm in this. this is I've you. been married for 21 years right. now. And look, this is a beautiful couple. They're older than me. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, if this, couple, just, if, this couple, if this couple is you guys and you listen to this show, reach out and let us know that you're actually the same age as Brian and so we pick the picture appropriately. So this is the age of rediscovery. As we mentioned, the empty nesters, the kids are starting to leave the nest. Financial goals are starting to be obtained. This is exciting stuff here. You've made progress financially. So this is a time to kind of celebrate That's if you've right. done it right. Yep. You know, so let's talk about, but let's, let's, let's be truthful. There's this trend that's going on right now. And Daniel, you know, old Grim Reaper Daniel came along with his Daniel's divorce stats. Yeah, now this one was kind of surprising to me until I thought about it, how I've seen it practically play out with friends and parents of friends of mine. Is uh, The divorce rate for couples 50 and over is significantly rising. And this is actually called the Great Divorce Revolution. Uh, rates have doubled between 1990 and 2010, and one in four divor divorces occur, occur, occur to couples 50 and over. I have to say, and as sad as is, my, my wife and I both have a number of friends we went through college with, and those friends' parents have now started splitting up. Like after the kids are out of college, fully off. That's kind of sad. It is sad. Yeah. My wife stuck with me. Now, she might be trying to figure out how she can get out, but she's kind of stuck with she's me. She's kind of stuck with you. This weirdo still wants to hang out with her, so we'll see. Hopefully, she feels the same way. But this is, I want to talk about traps to avoid. Sure. Um, you know, this is, we've mentioned this in a previous one, but this is actually the age where I think you really have to worry about that midlife crisis yep. is, is legitimate. That's I'm right. old enough. Um, cause remember, we've done research out there and shared the, stat, the data point that the unhappiest age for the average man is 45 years of age. And mathematically, based on when most folks get married, 45 is right around that 21 Well, and, and what, what, what happens is there's multiple things. People, you know, when you're younger, you're like accomplish, 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 meaning I'm gonna to try to work hard at work, I'm gonna get as many promotions. I feel like I need to go have kids by this age, I need to have a house by this age. Mm -hmm. You're putting all this pressure on yourself and then you're, you're just busy, you're working, you're stressed. And then one day you look around and go, I don't even like my job. Yeah. I don't like where yeah. I'm at. I don't, you know, I don't like where I am. And people start questioning. They, they, then this is when the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. If I'll just go make this, guys, I'm telling you, the quickest way to just die, slice and dice your net worth, go get a divorce. That's right. I yeah. mean, and I've exactly seen a right. lot of trouble um, from people, you know, thinking things could be better. And we've even had, you know, some friends that. I mean, I've, I've seen marriages that have ended, but they realized after, because they love their kids, they love, and they're like, man, what? it wasn't greener. And they've mm -hmm. actually gotten back together. Yeah, I mean, yep. you see this, sometimes Absolutely. you do see people get divorced and get back together because people realize, man, that was, that was, that was my mind playing tricks on me. That's something evil. That's something bad that was you know, making me, it's that inner voice. Yeah. I've told y'all, watch that inner voice. And that can, that can keep you out of a lot of trouble. So, so be careful of the midlife crisis. The second trap that we see in this phase all the time is actually taking too much risk. Oh, yeah. And we see it for two reasons. The first reason are folks who feel like they're behind the gun, like, uh-oh, I got to make up some time. So I'm going to go out there and take some crazy financial risks to make up for some decisions that maybe I didn't make right earlier on in life. Yeah, that's, that's the, the first one. That's the investment allocation, taking too much exactly risk. Exactly right. There is people, because of your success... And I, I have used this term around some of our friends that She's, fall in his cabin. She gets so mad at me. Dumb doctor deals. I use this term around doctors and my wife gets so mad at me. But I, there's a reason we call them dumb doctor yep. deals. Is you start having a level of success and people know you have money so they start pitching you these deals. Right. Don't, avoid those things, guys. It's just not as good as you might think it is. And then the last thing, Bo, 
is putting the adult kids ahead of your financial health. You know, Brett, we talk about this all the time. We talk about the airplane oxygen mask example, right? You know, one of the things you have to do is you have to make sure that you are on solid, firm financial footing yourself. Well, a lot of times when the kids fail to launch, they just think, oh, mom, dad, they've got money. They've got their 401k. They've got social security. They've got fill in the blank. You got to be careful that you don't put your kids on economic outpatient care. I think it's interesting. I always go back. We have the the awesome book that helped motivate me to be who I am, The Millionaire Next Door. One of the key stats that Dr. Stanley talks about in The Millionaire Next Door is economic outpatient care you have to give to adult children. How great is it? It's an indicator of success, even by in The Millionaire Next Door, as how you know self-sustaining your adult children are. So yep. don't put those adult kids ahead of your financial health. I know you love them, you wanna do what's right by them, but you gotta make sure that you don't, you're don't you not dying a death of a thousand paper cuts by helping them with every little thing, but also making sure that you're not, just not paying for way too many mm-hmm. things at your own detriment. Don't allow them to live a lifestyle above their means simply because you can, because you're not doing them any favors. At, at the loss of your financial okay. independence. So let's, let's pivot over to positive stuff. Okay. Indicators of success, this is the stage where I want you to be completely debt free. Yeah. I'm always amazed. If you go and look at our YouTube comment section, we've done some shows on debt payment. Mm-hmm. I think people have the wrong idea about me in debt. I actually love paying down debt. Yeah. My thing is, I just want while you're in your 20s and 30s to get your order of operations right, to let that money, that compounding interest work for you. Right. But I do think at this phase of your life, once you hit your mid to late 40s, you better be trying to get out of debt. I mean, I want you to be completely debt free before you walk through the gates of financial independence. So if you're at this stage and you've accomplished a lot of those other financial goals, it is perfectly fine to start paying down that mortgage early and getting out of debt completely. The second indicator of success that we think is just huge in the stage is that you can actually see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're not wandering around lost anymore thinking, oh my goodness, what am I doing? You kind of know what your plan is and you can see the horizon line. You can see the landing strip. You can see the place that you're going. It's no longer just this dream. It's something that's actually there that's almost within your reach. Knowing where you're going is a powerful thing. There's a reason we have maps. Yep. We don't just all wander around. I mean, it's, well, it's there's so much more G- powerful. GPS. Just, I guess people don't use There's a reason you use navigation on your phone or in your car. Nobody even uses a car. That's even outdated. It's amazing you have to watch that stuff. The kids are actually leaving home. We yep. are. I've already picked on that you point know. enough. Um, and then you're enjoying the fruits of deferred gratification. I have shared with you guys, this is one of my favorite things, is I started saving very young. I've seen this with a lot of my clients that reach this phase. It is so cool when you reach the level of wealth that you can start without guilt eating out yep. and eating. If you want to order a soft drink, if you want to order a cocktail, you can do, do it. it. You're not breaking anything. You can have vacations. You can even go get coffees. I loved it that we published some pictures of... Um, the team meeting that we had on, uh-huh. you know, for show prep. By the way, it was Daniel that gets the juice box that's, of the dragon exactly fruit. The one right. that looked like Kool Aid was actually that's Daniel. If you're, not, if you're not following us on Twitter, you need to follow us on Twitter because we post all kind of cool little things to let you see behind the scenes. And it is one of those things, though. As soon as we posted that video, I mean that picture, we had people that brought up David Bach and oh, some of the others. The latte, you know, you know, the latte factor and the fact of, you know, you go jeopardize your... No, if you've done it right and you've invested and saved, yep. you can do these type of things because you're getting the fruit of deferred gratification. Right. Let's kind of close out with some of those tools, Bo, that, that people should be using at this phase. Yeah, again, I think a fee-only fiduciary financial advisor is huge here because there's a chance in this stage you're going to enter a new phase of life and you're going to feel a different kind of stress than you've ever felt before. And you and your spouse are navigating that together. You're moving into this stage. So having someone who can come alongside you and help you stress test your retirement, make sure that you've thought of all the contingencies, make sure there aren't any glaring mistakes in your plan, that can just be a huge, huge, huge resource for you in this stage. Um, I I hate the title of this one. I was trying to think of something witty, but I think just for the sake of that, you'll know what it is, the bucket list. Yeah. This is the one, hopefully, when you're having those date nights where you're talking about your travel journal and the things, places you want to go. Do I just don't, what I don't like about the title bucket list is like, thinks you're going to kick the bucket. Right, right, These right. These are things you want to accomplish. I think that has a negative connotation, but it is definitely, the, the, the concept is there is that this is the stage where you have done a journey well done, 21 to 40 years, 
be, you know, go ahead and create those things that yep. you do want to make sure you accomplish to have that fulfilled life that you've already accomplished so much in. Right. I mean, it is so powerful, guys. I love, I mean, this show on marriage, I mean, it, truthfully, it's fun because yeah. it not only lets us poke fun at each other, but it also evokes a lot of great memories mm-hmm. because um, marriage marriage can be awesome if you do it right. right. And we want to just kind of equip you with the tools so that if you are on some, you know, shaky ground, you're on maybe... Um, you're, you're on a dirt road and you're hoping it turns into a gravel road and then it's going to turn into a paved road. These tips and tricks can definitely help you get those transitions right. And we want to load you up. I mean, that's the whole driving factor of this show As we love on you. We call it the abundance cycle. We give you tons of free advice and you just keep growing. You come, learn, grow, and then you start reaching tremendous levels of success. And you're like, well, why are these guys doing this? Why are they loving on us so much? It's because we know if we do this for you, you will reach that point of success where you're going to say, I need somebody to look over my shoulder. I need a co-pilot. I need somebody because this, this enterprise has gotten so big. I would sure like to, I'm the CEO of this thing. I'd like to have a CFO that can make sure we're doing it right. That's what we're here for. We call it the abundance cycles. We'll love on you, give it away, and then hopefully you'll come back to us. We work with clients all over the country. In the meantime, subscribe on YouTube. I mean, go ahead and ring the bell for good service. I mean, go let us know. That's what this number behind us is. I want you to subscribe to our podcast. We want you to go to moneyguy.com. Give us your email address. Yep. That's a big one too. Big things coming your way in the future, and we want to keep you posted on that. That's it. Bo, did I leave anything off? No, nope, I think you know it. We feel so fortunate we get to do this. Uh, go out to YouTube, subscribe. Go out and give us your email address, and uh, stay in tune. We love talking to you guys. Money Guy team, out.